Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Welcome to Ed Talks. We're very proud to be here for our second year. Um, it's lovely to see so many friendly faces, fellow luminaries of TV land. Now, some of you might be sat there thinking, hold on a minute, Peter Fincham looks a lot younger, a lot more attractive, and a lot taller than I remember. Um, I should probably tell you that the controller session is just across the hall. My name is Dan Walker, and I'm here to host Ed Talks. And today, our theme is all about talent. And I know we only have one hour, and in that one hour... Oh, you were looking for Peter Fincham. In that one hour... <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I'd get that out of the way early. I'm glad that, rather than thinking, shall I leave now, it could be awkward, you're just going for it. So thank you very much for that. Um, see you later. Enjoy that session. Uh, she will miss out because we have one hour in which we will hopefully engage with you and you'll really get an insight into what talent is all about and get a unique perspective from five very different speakers who are going to come up here on the stage. Um, you can join in, you can sit there, you can holler and whoop and clap and all that sort of stuff. Uh, you can also tweet as well. I know the Wi-Fi isn't particularly wonderful at the moment, but there is 4G. Um, if you do want to tweet, the hashtag is, I'll get this right, um, EdTVFest40. So EdTVFest40 is what you can tweet on. And if you do put something interesting on there about any of our speakers, I will try and remember to read it out in between. I should say that I did a session like this and an event like this a few months ago. And uh, I received a tweet that said, uh, Dear Dan, I watch you on TV every week. I never knew that from the side your nose looked a little bit like a deformed cashew nut. So <laughs> please don't get too personal. I know I look strong and powerful, but I'm mentally fragile like everybody who works in TV. So just, just keep it nice and friendly and fresh, and I'm sure we'll have a fantastic hour together. Uh, let me introduce who's going to be up on stage, and then we'll get our first speaker here. So please give a big round of applause. First today... Um, he's not going to be on stage first, but a little bit later on, we have the I -tennis, I I -tennis? iconic tennis coach Judy Murray with us today. Thank you. <laughs> also, you'll hear from the international playwright and performer, Anua Ellums is with us today. <laughs> the star of the eagerly anticipated BBC sitcom Boy Meets Girl, Rebecca Root, will address us <laughs> this afternoon. I love this title as well, the creative force behind some of the UK's top talent. That does sound good, that. The principal of the Brit School, Stuart Warden, is one of our guest speakers. <laughs> and first up on stage, the creator and host of the Vsauce YouTube channels. Please give a very warm Edinburgh welcome to Michael Stevens. My name is Michael Stevens, and I created the Vsauce Network on YouTube. You might think Vsauce, that's a pretty ridiculous name, and it is, but you can't blame me for it. It came from fakenamegenerator.com. I was asked to create a channel that would appeal to teenagers, and I didn't want to call it something lame, so I just said, let's make a random word up. And this website allows you to create fake identities, fake credit cards, fake social security numbers, and also domains that are ab available to be purchased and are in English. And I, I just hit refresh all day, vsauce.com showed up and I'm like, that's it. It meant nothing and so the channel could evolve and become whatever um, it wanted to. Can you imagine if I'd named it Video Game Comedy? It couldn't have become what it is today, which is an education network that covers informational things of all varieties, philosophy, chemistry, science, history. These are the current hosts of the three channels in the network. Uh, there's me in the green, there's Kevin in the blue shirt, and Jake in purple. The channels that we host and run are very, very creatively titled Vsauce 1, that's mine, Vsauce 2, and Vsauce 3. You didn't see that one coming, I'm sure, but I wish I'd kind of thought a little bit more about that. However, the names are easy to evolve. The channels can become whatever the individual hosts or the audiences want because the name tells you nothing about what it promises. Anyway, um, we have a sort of infectious curiosity. We want to excite people about learning. And the kind of niche that we found is hilariously bizarre questions that we take extremely seriously. Um, and we have been endorsed by everyone from uh, ben Franklin to Albert Einstein, who time-traveled to our billion-view party last summer. The network hit a billion views on YouTube last summer, 
and the Vsauce One channel that I run has 870 million as of this morning. So really close to having my own billion. But that's also a testament to how excited people are about learning. Here's a screenshot of my last 20 videos. And you can see that each episode gets more than 2 million views, sometimes 3, 4. Um, Spooky Coincidences has 6. Is Earth Actually Flat? has 6 million views. Spoiler alert, it is not flat. <laughs> But this episode talks a lot about the philosophy of science and the philosophy of knowledge. How do we know things? And um, I often take on funny questions like, is cereal soup? Is cereal a type of soup? I mean, it fits every definition of soup. <sighs> maybe, maybe it's a type of salad and the dressing is the milk that you add on top. That episode is all about linguistics and the meanings of words and how we kind of just make them up. Um, and it's actually very important legally. Uh, recently, there was a court case about whether burritos were sandwiches. And I, it turned out that they are. A sandwich chain had a contract with a mall that said you cannot have any other sandwich shop move into this mall. And then a burrito place moved in and they said, no. You said no sandwiches and now there's burritos? And the court said, yeah, it's, it's a stuff between bread, so. Anyway, these are important, important questions. And uh, what, what I think is actually important about them is the accidental learning that occurs. I'll ask something funny like, wait, if you were traveling at the speed of light and you turned on your headlights, what would happen? Would the light come out? Would it like not even come on? Would the light pool up inside like an overflowing bowl? Well, let's talk about what light is, what the speed of light is, and what the laws of physics tell us. So that's what I do, and I found a, an, an enormous audience on YouTube, even though some of these might seem a little niche. My newest one is a 25, 24 minutes and 14 seconds long video about the Bonnock-Tarski paradox, which is part of set theory and is very, um, well, it takes a while to explain, but so far, more than three million people have wanted to learn about it and spend 24 minutes on higher mathematics, which is awesome. Um, but I'm here to talk about talent. Specifically, digital talent, but there's not a difference. This came up in a panel yesterday, and I think Tom Scott put it really well. He said, guys, YouTube is a platform, not a genre. It's a place you put things, but what you put there can be of many, many varieties. And so digital talent, talent in traditional uh, medium, um, artistic talents of different types, they're all pretty much the same. I'm talking about talented people who have a talent for getting attention, and for not just getting attention, but for getting fans. That's why this is titled, What Are Fans? Because I think what really defines what works on YouTube is a type of person that can make people want to keep coming back. Follow them to other platforms, to other genres, that's what talent does. The word talent comes from this, scales. Back in the days when money was weighed against precious metals, Money was sometimes called talents. Maybe you've heard of the parable of the talents. So back in the ancient Roman times, we had uh, scales. And the coins you measured out were called talents. So why are they called talents? Because they cause the scales to incline. And that's what talent is, an inclination. It's this kind of natural thing that you just do. The coins didn't try to make the scales move, they just did. And a lot of the success stories on YouTube, especially now because YouTube is still so young, are just people who intuitively do a great job at attracting attention and fans. They don't always know how to even say what they're doing, but they're doing it very well. So let's talk about what those things are. They come in four different varieties, uh, at least the ones I'll talk about today. They have a handle. They are soup to nuts. They're open and they help people express who they are. In other words, talent are novelty mugs. They have a handle, they're open, you can express yourself with it, and what was the other one? Uh, I don't even... Nuts. Soup to nuts, yes, that was a quiz. Uh, do, how many people here know soup to nuts? The fr it's, it's a saying. Okay, so it's, it's an American English saying. I looked it up after the rehearsal because I was like, no one knows what I'm talking about. When I first heard it, I didn't know what it meant, but it means from beginning to end. Uh, apparently, 
uh, the, a, a meal in America at the time this phrase came about began with soup and it ended with nuts for dessert. So someone who is a soup to nuts person can do everything in a process from the beginning to the end on their own. At least they know how to do it. There's a Roman phrase, it's in Latin, and it's uh, ab ovo usque ad mala. Means the same thing, but a Roman meal was eggs to apples. So anyway, this is totally useless, but kind of cool. Actually, I should put this in an episode. So, so uh, let's start off with the first, uh, which is to have a handle. What do I mean by handle? Well, what I mean by handle is that you can hold on to it. You can grab it and you can show it to other people and you can share it with them and you know how to push against it. You know how to share it. A lot of things are made that, that the viewer will watch, they'll click on, but then they don't know how to talk about what they just saw. They don't know how to spread it by word of mouth because there's not a handle for them to easily manipulate it with. And that I think is one of the biggest skills that digital, digitally talented people, people who are successful on digital platforms have. They naturally know how to make something that a blogger can write about, that someone can easily tweet about because there's a way to describe it that only takes a tweet length of letters. Um, when I first began making videos, I was an actor on stage. So I definitely was that kind of person who wanted attention. And I decided, well, what will get a lot of clicks? That's all I wanted. I just wanted clicks on the internet. And so I created this masterpiece. Maybe you've seen, oh, this masterpiece. We'll go back to that. Um, it's, a, it's a little uh, piece of art video called Hillary Clinton farts. Has anyone seen this video? Uh, well, 6.9 million people have, and there's another version that someone actually ripped from me and put up, and that has 9 million views. But I said, let's leave them all up because this is an important moment in American history. I literally just put a fart sound effect over Hillary Clinton and then ad added in some reactions. It's very immature, my mother was very ashamed, but yet, <laughs> but yet, seeing this, you couldn't help but look, and if you search the title, even now on Google, you get a Yahoo answer results of people going, is that video real? So, so I, I've now progressed to different things, but I had that initial, like, I know what I need to do to make sure that College Humor and Break and everyone on YouTube is like, well, I have to see what this is about. And in fact, YouTube's roots are in that. Let's go back. This is the earliest screen grab of YouTube.com. YouTube was originally a dating website. They don't always say that but they cannot deny the fact that archive.org has them caught. This is April uh, 28th, 2005. And that's, YouTube was about finding people. The dating websites will come back uh, at the end. I'm gonna speed through some of this because I'm running low on time, but the first ever banner ad, you know, brought on, brought on a whole host of things that we hate now. Advertisements can be annoying, but because it was the first, you know what its click-through rate was? 44%, yeah, first banner ad. Firstbannerad.com, you can go and learn more about that. Okay, soup to nuts means that they can go from the beginning to the end, they can do everything. Because in the early days of the internet, there was no partner program, it was hard to get funding and money, so you needed to just do it yourself. And that's what I did. I wanted to make Hillary fart, so I Googled, how do I add sound effect to clip? How do I get clip from CNN? Uh, pff, all these kinds of things. And uh, here's an example of how I produce my videos. Um, I have a camera and my little script there that I look at. I don't use an auto cue, but I do memorize what I'm about to say. Um, someone drew a picture of what my process looks like, which is quite accurate, actually. <laughs> Once I was in a hotel and I didn't have a tripod with me, so I taped a camera to a waste bin on top of a chair. And then I also use YouTube to check the analytics because those, these things are immediate. I immediately know when people are watching, when they're leaving a video, and um, I, I get little notifications like my, my randomness video suddenly increased my number of subscribers. And I can say, well, why is that? Was it embedded somewhere? And find out and make programming changes accordingly. Uh, they're open. Digital talent is open because they have to do everything themselves, but also because YouTube is video on demand, they don't feel competitive with others. They feel like they can cooperate because watching Hannah Hart doesn't mean that you're choosing not to watch Miranda Sings. These people have their own things going on, but they appear in things all the time because it helps their audiences find out about one another. Also, they're open to the audience. They're revealed to the audience. When you watch this, you feel like I know exactly how their shows are made. 
I know exactly what it's like during that shoot. And if I ran into Hannah on the street, I could ask her anything. And she would never say, I don't know the producers that did it. She is the producer. In fact, when she needs a close-up of what she's been cooking, she doesn't have the crew move in for a close-up. She holds the plate up and, and tries to show it to you in detail before it falls off. And it always falls off, and that's part of the joke. But I love that she treats it like, I'm not doing this for a crew or for a vast audience at home. I'm doing it for you, this one camera. And you can't move, so I will do everything I can for you. Um, and then finally expresses who you are. I, I really think that a key part of what digital talent is doing is that they are helping people express who they are. When someone shares a YouTube video, when someone favorites a tweet, when someone likes something on Facebook, they're not doing it to help like me or the creator, they're doing it to help themselves. They're doing it to show off who they are. And we all do this. The clothes that we wear, the music we listen to, the things we know about our favorite subjects are ways for us to show off what we stand for, what we're like. When you like something on the internet, you're showing everyone who watches you that you are like that thing. So here's some just quick examples. And I know that I'm, I'm, I'm low on time, but I loved Beekman, the TV scientist from when I was a kid, so much so that I dressed up like him for Halloween. <laughs> That's my sister as a genie. That was actual lab equipment from my dad's chemical engineering job, and it was very dangerous and dirty. It had like dangerous heavy metals in it, and I'm just like, oh yeah, well this will be a good prop, and my dad's like, mm -hmm. So, now I'm here today, still alive, but I looked great. And on Vsauce, that's what I, I try to do. I try to make things that will allow people to say, yes, finally, an answer to this. Or, hey guys, look at this video I found from Vsauce. Doesn't that make me look cool? Doesn't that make me look curious? That's what people want, content created to let them show off who they are, not who you are. Um, and then finally, one day, I looked on Twitter, and three guys for Halloween had dressed up like Jake, Kevin, and I. And they did a pretty good job. So it all came full circle, mission accomplished, closed the channels down, we did it. Just kidding, we're gonna keep going. And um, the thing I'll leave you with, this is like the worst way to end anything because it's very creepy, but on dating websites, you can often search by keyword. Like you can look up meatloaf and then find other girls who love meatloaf and then you can message them about, hey, let's go have meatloaf together or whatever. Favorite TV shows you like, all of those. I, of course, joined OkCupid and searched Vsauce, found a bunch of girls who literally listed the network I started as something that they define themselves by. I did not dare talk to or click on any of their profiles because that is so creepy. And I did find a girl and she had never even heard of like YouTube, I think, which was healthy for me. But this is it. Talent is like a novelty mug and it makes people, it allows people to express who they are. So thank you very much. Michael, thank you very much for that. Um, I don't know about you, I'm going to start using soup to nuts as a, as a regular conversation starter. I learned a lot there about eggs, about apples, uh, cereal, and this for a man, as, as Michael said, I think that's probably worth another round of applause. 870 million views on YouTube. Come on, that's, uh, that's the sort of thing we all dream of. Right, our next guest. Uh, I've got a stat about her as well. This is pretty impressive. We know that she's a renowned tennis coach, but I didn't know that she'd won 64 national titles during her own career as well. You may have heard of her sons. <laughs> it's Judy Murray, everybody. Um, first thing to say is that I am not entirely comfortable doing this sort of thing. I'm a bat and ball person. You usually find me um, on a tennis court. I'm also getting to that sort of age where I regularly forget what I'm about to say and what I'm about to do. And uh, my partner on Strictly, the lovely Anton Dubeck, discovered that very soon into our uh, dancing relationship uh, to the extent where one day when we were waiting backstage to go onto uh, the, the walk-on. You start at the top of the stage and you walk down the stairs, so you actually have to line up on a stair going up the way. And uh, two of the dancers, Caroline and Pasha, who went on to win the series, were practicing down a side corridor. And I went to have a little look at what they were doing. I came back and I said to Anton, why do you never do that with me? And he said, waste of time, my love. You would forget it halfway up the stairs, <laughs> which was absolutely right. Anyway, we weren't here to talk about it strictly. We're here to talk about uh, nurturing sporting talent. So. Aww. 
Well, as you can see, this is Jamie and Andy, age two and three. They have Wimbledon t-shirts already and they have tennis rackets, so clearly I was bringing them up to become Wimbledon champions. <laughs> Clearly I wasn't, somebody else gave them the t-shirts, I did actually buy them the, the bats. But um, for me, um, at that age, they don't have talent. Uh, they are waiting for parents to introduce them to trying lots of different uh, things and creating the opportunity for them to try sport or, or, or other activities and then to spend the time with them, helping them to either develop a love for what they're doing or the skill uh, to, to take it forward. So for my kids, uh, they were very fortunate that they had parents and grandparents who would play every sport under the sun with them whenever they wanted to because we are a very uh, sporting family. So when they were young, they developed really good uh, hand-eye and foot-eye coordination skills so that it wouldn't have mattered what sport they'd wanted to try as they got older. They'd have been able to do it uh, fairly uh, competently. Uh, their first... Uh, court playing tennis was with a balloon over our sofa in the front room, uh, graduated to swing ball in the backyard and then two chairs with a piece of rope in the driveway and sponge balls playing tennis uh, at, at home. We did however live very close to the tennis court and therefore when you're talking about nurturing sporting talent the proximity of a suitable facility is actually very important. So we were about 500 meters from the local tennis club and uh, at the time that my kids were small, I was a volunteer coach at our local club. I was also working as a, a sales rep. Um, but when Andy was five, he announced to me one day that he was fed up playing with me and his brother and his granny, and he wanted to play in a proper tournament. And when I looked at the local leagues in our area, they were for under 12s, and he was only five and Jamie was six, so obviously that's like years away. So what I did was I created a, a, a tournament. I, I contacted a number of other coaches that I knew, and they brought some of their other children who were under 10, and we had a real fun uh, competition. And from that, those other coaches took the idea back to their clubs, and so a kind of under 10 circuit was born um, in Scotland. Because as you know, Scotland is not a tennis nation. We have terrible weather, hardly any indoor facilities um, still and it's very much a minority sport up here and no track record of, of um, success at all. So when uh, he was seven and uh, six and Jamie was seven, uh, the competition thing is still a bit of a, an issue and also tennis is an individual sport. It's much more fun for kids to play things with their friends and to play in teams. So I discovered that there was a primary school uh, tennis championship, a, a British uh, thing and uh, so I entered a team from Dunblane Primary School. The other parents helped me to run the team and I, I kind of did the coaching and they um, set up the fixtures and so forth but it was stimulating a love of playing the game which is quite different from a love of hitting a ball over uh, the net and it was around this time that I updated my or upgraded I guess my coaching qualification that I'd done when I was a student and I'd done it uh, as a means of making some pocket money when I was a student uh, but as the as some of the kids that I was working with at the club got better and better, I realised that I didn't know enough, so I upgraded my qualification, which gave me a lot of information, but actually no real um, understanding of how to apply that information um, practically. And one of the issues in Scotland for me when I got more and more into tennis coaching was that there was nobody to learn from. Um, very few tennis coaches in Scotland, and, and in actual fact, there they're, um, still are. So. Uh, Moving on just, just a little bit, this is uh, the boys at sort of eight and nine when they had played each other and, are st and fought with each other in the final of an, of an under 10 uh, competition. By this uh, time, I was the Scottish national coach. Um, I really didn't have any business being the Scottish national coach as in uh, I wasn't particularly qualified, but the post had been vacant for 18 months and it might sound like quite a grand thing to be the national coach, but we are talking a very, very minority sport. So the post had been vacant for 18 months. Uh, somebody encouraged me to apply for it. I applied for it, they gave me the job, and I pretty much had a blank canvas because nothing had been happening for such a long time. And around the same time, the first indoor tennis centre in Scotland opened at Stirling University, which was about five miles from where we live. So I go back to the local, local facility offering an opportunity. I had a salary of £25,000 and a budget of £90,000, and that was for everything from talent identifying age seven right up to the senior team. You actually can't play for Scotland at tennis. You play for a GB. It's a GB sport, but that was it. £90,000, four courts, and a £25,000 salary, no staff. 
And um, what I did was I, I set up um, what I called a development school at, at Stirling. And it was just on weekends because the kids had to come from across the country. So they had to travel long distances. Um, and we started with 20 children that I kind of handpicked from around the country. And of those, Andy was probably the youngest one, uh, Elena Baltasha would have been the oldest one. Um, but of those 20 children that we started with, four went on to play Davis Cup and one went on to play Fed Cup uh, for Great Britain. Four of them played Olympics, two of them have won Grand Slams. Uh, one's won Olympic gold and silver, another has won a Commonwealth Games uh, gold medal. So my message when I talk about this is actually it's not about what you have, it's what you do with what you have. And my initial starting point of staff was actually the, the parents. But I also had to develop a workforce. So I got £10,000 from Sports Scotland for performance coach development. And I started with six coaches. And I brought in coaches from overseas to um, help me, because I didn't know, um, to help me and to help them. And of those six coaches that I started with, one heads up disability tennis in the UK, one runs a scholarship programme at Stirling University, one is one of uh, GB's top coach educators and the other one is uh, GB's Davis Cup captain. So actually out of pretty much nothing, we got a huge um, payback. Not used to using these things. Um, fast forwarding again, um, moving into when uh, Jamie and Andy were kind of around 12, uh, they had the opportunity to go to Miami to play in the Orange Bowl, which is a kind of unofficial world 12 and under uh, championships. And Jamie went one year, Andy went the following year. Jamie made the final, Andy won it. And what for me had been like a huge adventure suddenly became quite serious because suddenly my kids were among the best in the world for their age and I realised that I didn't know anything. So again, I had to travel. Um, I kind of picked every everybody's brain, I videoed people, I had notebooks and notebooks full of uh, notes from speaking to people because I had to learn about, I know my kids are among the best in the world under 12, How, what, do we, what do we do next, what's the next two years look like and actually for me the learning has always been about what comes next, finding somebody who's done that next stage, pick their brains and then try to apply it as best as we, we could um, over here. Also think it's worth mentioning at this stage that I have I have two children, um, and although they both have careers as professional tennis players, they are both very different from each other. And the whole thing, I think, about nurturing talent is to the better you can get to know what's in front of you as people, the more influence you can have over them because you then know what they re react to, what they respond to. I have two very different children in terms of character. One is left-handed, one's right-handed. Physically, they are very different, and personality, they're actually also very different. So Andy, of course, right-handed, uh, plays singles, a very um, aggressive baseliner. Wasn't always an aggressive baseliner, was probably more a, a passive baseliner with um, exceptional hand skills, which were developed at a young age. And Jamie's skills were all around the net and on serve. So he went on to become a very successful doubles player, Andy went on to become a very successful singles player, but they went through, although they came up in the same way, they went through very different routes um, to get there. Uh, Jamie um, obviously finished school, could have gone to an American university, wanted to play tennis. It was very clear to me when he was about 19 that he wasn't going to make it as a singles player, had to find an expert doubles coach to help him, could only afford six weeks with this guy. But seven weeks after he started with Jamie, he made his first ATP uh, tour final. It's Andy winning the US Open Juniors. Uh, that was when our life changed. Suddenly had to learn to deal with being in the spotlight, deal with the media, but also to learn the life and business of being a full-time athlete rather than just a coach of junior players where it's actually all great fun uh, and a big comfort zone. Jamie won the Wimbledon title first um, a year after he started with this coach that I could only afford for, for six weeks. So he kind of led the way uh, in that. And then, of course, six years after that, Andy managed to win uh, his first Wimbledon title. But all those years in between, there's lots and lots of learnings. There's lots of changes of coach. There's, uh, so for me, it's all about trying to do the right thing at the right time and finding the right people to put around them at the right time. because. And, and being in the background, trying to manage uh, everything that, that you have to learn. But everything's new um, for us. And for me, it was very much learning uh, as, I, as I went along.
This is us, all of us. We still try to encourage um, uh, children to become physically active and, and play sport. Uh, obviously, our sport's tennis, but I think the importance of, of keeping kids phys physically ac active is uh, very uh, much a part of what they can, the boys can do as, as role models in the sport. So my message really is that talent uh, without opportunity doesn't come to anything. You need talent, you need opportunity, then you need the right environment, and you need to be able to work hard. You never really know where you're going to get. But um, it is often the case that you get opportunity without talent. <laughs> and it doesn't really come to very much. So then you, then you have to flip it on its head and, you, and you, you do what you do best and you teach your partner how to play tennis. And I'm happy to say that he was just as bad at tennis as I was at uh, dancing. <laughs> the end. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. What a fascinating insight into, into the nurturing of talent. I said to, to Judy before this as well, what, what the thing that I really love about that tale is that um, those of us who are in the room who are, who are British know that we're very good at moaning and very good at complaining about things. And I'm sure you, probably like me, were thinking during that, well, what would you do in that situation where you've, you've got kids who need to play in a tournament? You, probably just moan about the fact there's no tournament and get on with something else. Well, you go for the sort of Kevin Costner feel of dream side of it and, and build it and, and look where your sons have got to. You must be a very proud mother as you are a successful mother as well. So Judy, thank you very much for that. Um, and now for something completely different. We have a uh, poet, playwright and performer with us. We're in for a real treat. Ladies and gentlemen, in your elements. Of all the boys of Plateau Private School, all the short-shorted, dust-dipped disciples of Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris, of all the wire-headed heathen, my posse of Voltron-forced, fraggle-rocked, teenage mutant hero nerds, each had a party trick, a talent. Kika B would eat a fistful of desert sand spiced with soldier ants. Truth it turned the beige mulch of rich tea biscuits, swallowed twice and lived to tell the tale. Dr. Mukoi could flatulate the first line of the national anthem <laughs> with such clarity, Raymond Ogunsayo swore he heard words. <laughs> tea could spit faster than fleas skip, further than lizards leap, spit so high we claimed him Herculean in form, the half god of rainfall. And of the four talents, I was the art kid awaiting the school bell. With the sun for floodlights, the ground for canvas, a sharp twig splashing sand about like paint. I would capture Kicker's grin, Dapper's musical sin, teeth thick lips, saliva dripping, an eye angled as a ghetto Van Gogh, shoulders hunched to get the staunch slouch right. We would pose beside the drawings, sculptures of ourselves. The other boys clustered, all dark-eyed and envious, but not enough to scatter sand in any way. So this day after, I sidled into school, still sketch louched, find a canvas suddenly blank, sand mysteriously smoothed. Most likely, the janitor simply did his job. But instead, we conjure how creatures of the night, voodoo priests and priestesses, mammy waters, bush babies, witch doctors and sorcerers, all the sulfurous quartz, crimson-eyed, dark-circled venom stuff, rumored to work the night with theorized they spent the hour playing with our sand. The priest outlined us in white chalk, spoken voodoo talk, that raised up dust dolls of us, who, naked with the witches, limboed with your brooms. The bush babies gaggled and good and devil glee till the clock struck three and vanished instantly. A foul wind of howling wolves swept through, leaving sand smooth as fresh sheets as the wide ruled page I dent and reminisce of tongues turned tireless, of dark art thrill, of how quick we fixed our little plight with fantasy, which flows, you know, it ever shapes, ever reveals the world an unquenchable sea of mist myth that wisp whips who ask it. Some trap it with tongue, some a double bass drum, some hum, some a little bit inclined to sculpted forms. A boy was enticed in with sand and a stick, or now as I do, with a pad and a bick. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah. 
So um, I'm primarily a poet and a writer, and that is kind of like a journey of how I ended up doing what I do. Um, so generally, there's the perception that talent is a good thing, and I think not always. And this last poem helps to illustrate that point. This is called, um, this is called Shame is the Cape I Wear. On the first day of holidays, my mother leaves a dark blue wrapper on her bed her polished boots in one corner, and in no time I assemble a superhero costume to protect the house against the plague of lizards and their spindly children. Tongues flicking, head nodding under afternoon heat, they are a reptilian evil. Every hero needs a nemesis. This cotton cape casts me as Nigeria's Superman, and they threaten life in the Lagos metropolis. No matter the property you buy, how tight shut the gutters, how climb-proof the walls, also how sharp be a crown of barbed wires, the lizards come. Father who insists a clean, well-swept backyard helps is away, and the long-tailed legion are confidently swarming all about the place, across the air vents, up the garden's wire mesh, too thin to survive their claws. Anyway, I'm hovering by that, meth, that mesh, a rubber band stretched between my fingers, cape flowing, and a quiver of toothpick-thick bristles, one curled against the taut elastic. I catch one lizard's beady, steady eyes, take aim, fire, and watch the bristle break through its back, first piercing its soft stomach, and my aim just gets better. An hour and their bodies piled, above a commotion of flies excitable over the stiffening flesh and blood, and I have watched my shadow lengthen to cover the gray and red-haired corpses, the backyard, a silent killing field, and I could almost feel that flowing cape deflate. Sometimes I think that little boy in his mother's work boots has followed me my whole life through. There he is when I'm laughing at a party and find a crimson drink spilled across the clean carpet, and when I look in the mirror to see what the years have done to me, when I'm flicking through news channels and catch a wartime president speak of collateral damage and first-class weapons, and the locals are broken behind soldiers and men in tweed who will fabricate stories of jubilant cheers and fist pumps, and shame is the cape I wear that day, shame. And that little boy, that shadow is there, his head hanging down as it did then, his hands shaking. Thank you, Nira. That was marvellous and a very different take on, the, on our concept of talent today. Thank you. Uh, our next guest, our penultimate speaker today, is due on stage at the Pleasance in well, just, just over an hour. So she's a very busy lady today. Please put your hands together for actor, lecturer and voice coach, Rebecca Root. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Dan. It's great to be here. Um, I play pieces of music like this before a class every so often because I like to introduce to a room the concept of something that I know I can't do because it contextualizes the things that I believe I can do. So I'm not a, an opera singer by any stretch of the imagination. Um, if there's a reality show out there, maybe, who knows, <laughs> give me a year. But, um, you know, we could all probably hum that tune, whistle it maybe, but how many of us in this room could, could sing that aria from Magic Flute? I don't know. So why am I here and who am I? I'm Rebecca Root, as Dan said, I'm an actor, uh, I'm a voice teacher, a lecturer, a sometime academic, a comedian, a poet, a photographer, uh, a writer, a collector, an artist, ceramicist, a uh, runner, jogger, swimmer, and some of those things I do for a living, and some are just hobbies. And those are things that I do. And then there's the other side of me, the, the, who, who am I? I am uh, Anglo-Irish, uh, mid-40s, uh, soft, wussy, southern British dwelling, uh, 13 and a half stone, six foot something, Sister, daughter, niece, auntie, female, trans person. 
and it is these bookends, being an actor and being a trans woman, a transsexual woman, a transgender woman, or however you wish to de describe me, those two bookends, I think, are why, I suspect why I'm here today, because I think that's what, I have a perspective which I think I would uh, be able to illuminate for you. When I was, um, when I was a kid, literally four decades ago, I, all I really ever wanted to do was uh, to be an actor and to be a girl. And how those two elements of, of my life have balanced um, are what I want, sort of want to talk about, because I, this, this play I'm doing at the, the, the Pleasance, uh, myself and the cast, we were asked by an interviewer the other day, um, so which of you is an actress and which of you is tr a transsexual? And we all went, well, hang on a sec, we're all, we're all actresses, we're all actors, and uh, those of us who are trans said, well, we're trans as well. You know, we can be both. You don't just have to be one or the other. <laughs> um, and yes, I am both. But for, for many years, my pursuit of my vocation as an actor was tempered by my desire to live in my true identity as a woman. So I pursued the acting. I did school plays, Amdram, um, National Youth Theatre, trained as an actor at Mount View Academy in London, uh, and I became a jobbing actor in the male role. And it was exhausting because you are living uh, a double lie. You're lying for a living, if you like, because that's what acting is. You're lying in a nice way, I hope. Um, and when you step off stage, you are continuing a lie because you're lying and saying, you know, I'm actually uh, this, this dude. I'm this guy. When I did not feel like that at all. And so I put my female identity into the corners behind me, until it came to the point where I thought, you know what, what's more important? How I earn a living or how I live, how I identify in the world? And I said to myself, you know what, right, I'm, I'm going to knock this on the head and I'm going to transition. So I thought, well, it'd be a shame if I don't act again, but we'll see what happens. And I transitioned about 10 years ago, around the time that YouTube was kicking off as a, a website. Um, and I went from, a, lo a lot of my friends thought, not that I was mad for transitioning, they thought, do you know how few parts there are for female actors? <laughs> And that was illuminated. I, I, was, I was once in a production of Hamlet. I'm going off script here now, but I was in a production of Hamlet. I was a spear carrier. Peter Hall directed it. Stephen Delane was in it, and it was a great production 20 or so years ago. And uh, there were three women in that production out of a cast of some 25. And when I transitioned, I went to see a production of King Lear or something at uh, the RSC, and of course there are a, a, a few women out of a cast of 25. On few, fewer than five people were female on that stage. And I thought, ah, that's what they meant. Right. <laughs> and then you add into the mix the fact that I'm a trans female. I'm not just a female person, female actor. I am a trans person. How many parts are there for trans actors? How many people out there are professional actors who also happen to be trans? Very few. But that's changing. And I'm thrilled to be part of this moment that my community ha is having, which is enjoying in the, the spotlight, the, the limelight, the glow, if you like, which started over across the water. Yes, thank you, um, America, for transparent oranges, the, the oranges something. Uh, oranges, not the only black. You know what I mean. Um, <laughs> I've really done my research on this. Uh, <laughs> Boys Don't Cry, all of those, those movies, some of which are, um, have trans women in those, those chief protagonist roles, and others do not. They have cisgender people playing trans roles. Cisgender means identifying as the, 
the gender with which you were assigned at birth. Um, I imagine the majority of people in this room are probably, I'm guessing, cisgender or would identify as cisgender. Um, so now, here in the UK, we're catching up. Catching up with America. Yay! We've got a little trumpet and we're blowing it. And I'm delighted to be part of that with Boy Meets Girl, which is uh, the BBC Two sitcom, which came from an initiative two or three years ago from the campaign group All About Trans. Uh, the BBC Writers' Room, uh, Tiger Aspect, and BBC Comedy. And through a, a process of table read, through pilot, through commissioning of the first series, um, and a number of auditions along the way, I am the girl in Boy Meets. Girl. And it debuts next Thursday, a week today. 3rd of September, 9.30, BBC Two, for six episodes into October. So please, please, please. Um, watch it. If you don't want to watch it, just tell somebody to watch it and that'll just get the, the viewing figures up. Um, I see I'm running out of time. So I just want to finish by, by sharing a little anecdote, which might seem a, a, a bit oblique, but last week I climbed the, the mountain, um, Arthur's Seat. I needed some fresh air and some exercise. And I'm sure if you haven't climbed Arthur's Seat yet, uh, if you do find time, do it. It's a, a fabulous view. The slope, the path up the hill is fairly steep. It's a bit rough, but it's okay. You can do it in 20 minutes of, of, hard, of hard walking, pausing to take a photo every now and again. And you keep going, you keep going. You think, bloody hell, am I nearly there yet? And you get to, well, you get to this little bit by the top, and it's a grassy slope, and it's really nice. It's where people are hanging out, having picnics and things. And you look at Edinburgh and the view, and it's just gorgeous. And you think, ah, oh, is this it? Is this the top? And the, then you look up and you see the, the rock, the, the, the volcanic plug at the top. And you think, oh, no, that's the top. And that's the tough bit. That's the bit where you've got to dig your heels in and get, get a bit dirty, holding on to rocks. And there, maybe there is another path around the back, which I didn't see, but I climbed up the side. And I feel like in my career and with my community, I feel like I'm now in that little grassy slope where I'm almost at the top but I've got something to aim for. I'm striving to get to, I hope, somewhere around the top of my profession, my love, my craft, my vocation of being uh, an actor, earning my living as an actor, and not just uh, any old actor, but um, a transsexual actor. It's a little bit lonely sometimes, but there are more of us coming through. If you come to see tra a transcripts at the Pleasance, you'll see six women on stage telling trans stories, experiences. There are more people coming through, talking to Stuart about his students at the Brit School. Some people there are identifying as trans. More and more people are feeling comfortable coming forward and identifying as trans. More and more actors are able to say, yeah, you know what, I'm not going to allow being trans to hold me back, and I'm not going to jeopardize my acting career for the sake of my gender identity. I just want to close by thanking you for giving me and my community this platform. It's essential that we have these conversations. Please do take them to your companies, your channels, and continue talking about this issue. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca is off to the Pleasants. Um, I'm sure if you'd like to go and see her, there are some, still some tickets available, so you can go and see Rebecca's play at the Pleasants. Um, you talked about Stuart. Let's get our final guest up. Please give a very warm welcome to the head honcho of the renowned Brit School, Mr Stuart Warden. The Brit School's in Selhurst in Croydon in South London. Um, we've been going for about 25 years. I've been there Pretty much all of that time, I'm a theatre teacher, um, and then during that time, I've, I've grown and, and, and now run the place. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that today, and I think where, in that school, um, where we've kind of tried to create something where young people can express themselves and be a bit like Rebecca, the person they want to be, to be the artist they want to be, and maybe find out what's in that place. So the song that brought us in, Rolling in the Deep, was by one of um, our former students, Adele Atkins. 
Um, Adele was a cracking kid at school, um, arrogant, lazy, funny, <laughs> talented, chain smoker. Um, but what I really loved about uh, Adele, and I loved watching her in assemblies, and I really enjoyed watching her in concerts at school, and Summer 19 was written while she was a student at our place, um, was a conversation we had in the humanities lesson once. Uh, I was covering the lesson, and they were doing the American Civil Rights Movement, and uh, we started talking about the Ku Klux Klan. And we started talking as a class about racism in the Deep South and what an issue that was. And I started talking about the song Strange Fruit that Billie Holiday was known for. And Adele said, uh, oh, I love Billie Holiday. So we began a conversation about the Ku Klux Klan and Billie Holiday and music and the power of music to talk about social issues. And in that moment, I think, encapsulates the need for us. If we want to create talent with young people, we've got to know what they believe in and we've got to encourage them to believe in something. And when they believe in something, some stuff can happen. So Adele went to a school, the same school that Jessica Cornish, who became Jesse J, went to, Katie O'Brien, who became Katie B, uh, The Rizzles, Kooks, The Feeling, a whole bunch of bands, um, actors like Kush Jumbo, Ashley Madakwi, Ivana Jeremiah from Humans, the new Spider-Man, Tom Holland, graduated a year ago, and he's just found out he's Spider-Man. That's crazy, <laughs> right? Um, uh, uh, poets like Kate Tempest, Laura Dockrell, uh, dance students who are now with DV8 or with uh, Matthew Bourne or with Pina Bausch. And increasingly, people in television and film industry as well, people in the media, uh, Gemma Kearney, the Mandem on the Wall boys, they are YouTube superstars, came up with an idea of three lads sitting on a wall chatting about stuff, and now they're making a movie about it. That's something special. So let's try and work out maybe what's going on in that institution that maybe other schools could learn from or society could learn from to make a more creative youth, a youth that kind of can, because they're the people we need, right? They're the people that are going to come up with the ideas that are going to knock the other ideas out of the water. So how are we going to encourage them? So the first thing I think we need to do is to talk about the status of those subjects. So if we think about this modern education system, it's narrow-minded, short-sighted, built on a really strange feeling that mathematics and English are more important than anything else. It's a crazy decision. Okay, that those topics are really more important than in science and history and languages. And right at the bottom is physical education and creative arts and performing arts. They're not as important as those other subjects. I think Judy might have something to say about that. And when we say to people, your subject that you're into, your talent, isn't as important as whether you're a mathematician, we're kind of in trouble. Of course, it's really hard to do algebra, right? Logarithm's difficult. Understanding comprehension, punctuation, that's very hard. But Mozart's really complex. Understanding and having the ability to create a dance piece that's going to change the world and make people cry, that's really hard. That takes a real particular brain and power. And we have to champion those powers. The subject that this, this festival is about, the media, <coughs> your subject is considered soft. It's a soft subject, right? Easy. It's really easy to make TV. Yeah? When you want to make a movie, God, that's, that's really soft. But actually writing about a poem is really hard. It's really soft to understand how ideology is disseminated to us and communicated to us through the radio and television and the internet. That's not soft, that's difficult. So we have to create a society that kind of values all subjects and therefore all talent to be of equal. When people say, that's not rocket science, I want to say, that's not dance. <laughs> you right? Imagine. So we've got an equal status for all subjects. Brilliant, we can make things happen. Then we've got to make access happen. We're lucky, our school is free. No one pays to go there. It's a state school, anyone can come. It doesn't have pushy parents paying for it. Um, anyone can come. I don't think it's really right that it depends how wealthy your family are, whether you start dance at the age of four, because mummy and daddy can pay for your ballet lessons. That doesn't, for me, seem right. It doesn't seem right if you want to be a movie maker and your parents can afford to buy you some great kit, then that can happen for you. But you might have loads of brilliant ideas and your imagination might be fantastic, but because you don't have access to the kind of means of production, that's never going to happen for you. So we have to make the arts free. Just imagine if, like, 1997, when we opened up the museums, imagine if we did that for theatres and for cinemas. You can come in for nothing, guys. It's never going to happen, but imagine if it could. At the school, we produce uh, free theatre every year for over 5,000 local primary school children. I believe that they should have access to the arts at an early age. Once we get access to the, them at an early age, then things can happen and creativity and talent can shine. I think that's really important. And if you're running a school or you're running an institution that can access young people into it, do it. Do it and don't charge them. Let them come for free. Find a way of making that happen. 
The other year I was outside our, our main theatre as a group of 10 year olds came out and they'd come to see a musical we'd written for 10 year olds and they were and I was thinking, did it go well, did it go well? And they were cheering, and I thought, oh, it went well, fantastic. And they were singing the songs and moving out. And this little lad, this little 10-year-old boy from South London, turns around to his mate and goes, that was the best play I've ever seen. And I was like, fantastic. <laughs> and his mate turned around to him and said, that's the only play you've ever seen. <laughs> and although we laugh, I'm sobered by that. How did he get to be 10 and never go to the theatre? Because the school didn't take him, didn't think it was important, because his parents couldn't afford it, because the West End is too pricey. How did that happen? And it shouldn't. So we've got to make the theatre free. We've got to make the arts as free as possible for access to happen. And so once we've got those people inspired, then what are we going to do to make that happen? We are going to say to them, we're going to trust you and we're going to give you freedom. So two things happen in our school that don't happen in our school, happen in other schools. We don't have school uniform because it's not interesting because it, break, it, make, it creates conflict and it stops you being the individual. When you're 14, you want to be an individual, and school says to me, no, you can't be an individual while you're here, only outside. So when's your creativity going to shine in school when you're being told what to wear? We don't have bells at school because people can read the time. They can get back from lunch because they know what time it is. Yeah, imagine in the Victorian society, we had a big um, you know, foghorn to start the working day. Get to work. So in work, you're a worker, and when you're outside work, you're a human. Same at school. School bell goes, I'm now, I'm now a, a school student. Outside of it, I'm a human. That should not happen. You should be able to express yourself and create your own talent from breaking down those boundaries. And once you're inside, you should be given trust. Trust to kind of express yourself and to be the person you want to be. So we do have an LGBT society at our school, a feminist society, and more increasingly, children talking about mental health issues because that's something that they believe in. We also believe giving students the chance to kind of risk and to make um, significant mistakes. Yeah, I know that in TV land you can't do that anymore, right? Can you? In our school we can and we should, and the school should encourage risk and failure as often as possible, because it's only then, as talented artists, we know how to move on. So if you're a music student in our school, you have to book the venue, get the technicians, hire the van, sell the show, work out your set list, get the technician on board, all yourselves at the age of 17. We had two shows come to Edinburgh this year, one of them from students who were 16 years of age, age who organised it all themselves. Didn't need mummy on daddy, didn't need an executive. They did it themselves because they had the confidence to go out and make their own theatre. And what do they make theatre about? They need to make theatre, this is my final point really, about what they believe in. If we're going to have the artists of tomorrow, today, we need to say, what do you believe in? Yeah? So how do we do that? One thing we do at school is we have a protest day. Um, which I love because it really sends nerves through everyone, where young people decide what do they care about and they create a theatrical response to it. What political issues matter to them and they're going to create a piece of theatre. So we've had pieces of theatre which asked for the end of the monarchy. Pieces of theatre that have said, OK, um, we need to talk about body image. We need to talk about animal rights. We need to talk about racism. We need to write songs about political stories that we care about. And we would never censor it. Why would schools censor what young people want to talk about? Because artists, they've got to work out what they want to say. And what they've got to talk, they don't want to be reflective all the time. And I know, of course, Adele's famous for writing songs about how she's feeling. But they also need to talk about the world. And when we talk about the world, we understand the world as artists. And therefore, we get the confidence to find our own voice to be the brave, original artists that this society needs. And to close with another example is that every Brit school student has to do at least one or two community projects a year um, where they use their talent to work with a community group. So they might work, we do a dance project with a disability school, we might do a project, a storytelling project with an Alzheimer's society. We've been working with young victims of rape in the local area recently and creating a piece of theatre so that young women don't put themselves in those vulnerable positions again. And we're doing a project at the moment, over the last 10 years in fact, uh, which I think is a great example of how we should encourage young people to use their talent to get to create empathy, create emotion, and to make extraordinary things happen. And this is at a local hospice, and this is what we do. So people in the last three months of their lives with a terminal illness work with our students to create artwork that reflects their own life. So someone who's got cancer and is right near the end might want to talk to someone about, I want to leave this behind as a piece of dance, and a dancer will create a dance piece for them. Or they might want to write a story about their lives and we we'll turn it into a monologue. Um, or they might want to write a song or record all their favourite songs in our radio station and be the DJ for the day. So we take the wheelchair up there with their oxygen and they'll record their kind of the stories that they want to believe in. 
And recently we've been working with an artist called Loyal Karner. Well, you'll know, you might not know him yet, but you will soon. Uh, he's a new rap artist called Ben Loyal Karner. And Ben had tragedy in his life two years ago, or three years ago, his grandfather died. And he turned around to me and said, Sir, do you mind if I, um, I want to be on the hospice project? And I said, no, you're too close to it, Ben. He said, no, no, let me, give me a chance. Um, I want to use my talent, I want to understand my grandfather's death by going to the hospice. And when he was there, he met a man called Martin. Martin was very ill. He had MND and he was really angry. So he had motor neurone disease and he was furious. And he was also furious that some bloody performing arts students had turned up at the hospice. And he was like, you know, well, I don't want to, well, I want to talk to you lot for I'm dying and I'm angry about dying. And Ben said, that's cool, my granddad was too. Should we talk about it? And together, this 17-year-old boy from South London and this man who was slowly fading wrote a piece of spoken word about the anger of dying. Ben helped him write it, helped him record it, and it became a piece to campaign about how we should talk about death and dying, because we have to. It was a 17-year-old boy. Uh, ben has ADHD, by the way, so therefore in other schools he would have struggled. His new EP came out on Monday. That's a plug for him. He's a great artist, Laura Kana. Um, and there he was, being brave, using his talent, and trying to make something happen with his heart and his kind of skill at the same time. I think that's very powerful. How you could be part of this, if you wish to be, is you want to come down to the school at any time, you're welcome, everyone's welcome. It's a school that everyone can come to and be part of. Um, ITV have recently given our students two work placements for children who maybe haven't got an opportunity in life, and thank you to ITV for doing that. It's really important that they're part of that. Because schools need you, actually. You need them, because you need new ideas, right? You need new program makers, new editors. But they need you, and that sort of working together, I think, could make some extraordinary things happen. Thanks so much. Cool. Thank you, Stuart. Um, that's it. Uh, time has defeated us. I really hope you've enjoyed Ed Talks. It's been a privilege for me to be involved in this today. Just two people to thank. Gemma John Lewis and Anna Fern for putting on this today from ITV. Thank you. You're both wonderful and lovely to work with. I hope you found it provoking, memorable and entertaining. Uh, it's been sponsored by UK TV. The last thing to say is somewhere... Are they outside? Yeah. Uh, there's books which have been produced promoting British creativity. It's called Tomorrow's People, Making Cultures for Creativity. All those books are free. You can grab a copy as you leave. One final round of applause, please, for all our guest speakers today. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of Edinburgh. See you later.